So Advent, specifically the first Sunday of Advent, is always accompanied by or guided by a reading quite like this one. A reading um, that is apocalyptic in nature. Um, the apocalypse in the Old Testament, in books like Daniel, um, the apocalypse in parts of what Jesus teaches in Mark, Matthew, in Luke, and then in books like Revelation, are not meant to scare us. Elements thereof are frightening and confusing, and sometimes our fear stems more from the confusion itself. Um, but it is very important to realize that the message of the apocalyptic literature in the Bible is always one of hope. It is always one that assures us that no matter the details, the end result is what we must hold on to. So we'll talk about that, about Isaiah, but also then specifically about Mark, but we will try and frame that in the broader context of what Advent means and the opportunity that Advent gives us as disciples to prepare for the second coming of Christ. We light at Advent the first candle as a sign and a symbol and a reaffirmation of the hope with which every Christian lives their life. If I were to ask you, um, if someone were to ask you walking down the street, or maybe even in church, what is the summary of Christianity? How would you sum up Christianity? There might be uh, a variety of answers. Each one might, might be true and might be good in some extent. One of the best answers is that which, uh, which Paul teaches us to say in his letters. Jesus is Lord. That's it. By saying Jesus is Lord, you sum up His ministry, His death, and His resurrection. By saying Jesus is Lord, you are saying He is Lord not only over a small piece of land called Israel, but over all of creation. By saying Jesus is Lord, you are saying He is not only Lord there where He lived 2,000 years ago, but throughout all of history, all past, all present, and all future. He is Lord of all time and all place. By saying Jesus is Lord, you are saying Caesar is not Lord. President is not Lord. Prime Minister is not Lord. King is not Lord. We have one Lord, one Master, Jesus Christ. The hope in that setting or in that statement is that no matter what we go through in this world, that statement of truth cannot be diminished because Christ has already been victorious over death and just as importantly over the future. Jesus is Lord is a statement and a confession of hope because no matter what happens next we know what the end game will be. Paul will say, to hope is to wait on things which we do not see. And that is true. Think about what, the, what Jesus teaches his disciples here. He makes it very clear, you will see signs of the breaking through of the kingdom. Think about a fig tree. When the seasons change and it becomes warmer, it shoots out new growth. When you see the new growth, you know that summer is near. Maybe, maybe we have a, uh, a better Australian example of that. Um, certainly my lawn is growing quicker now than it was two months ago. You might say, well, yes, the season is changing. It's a bit warmer. There's more water available. Um, but even so, even though you will see signs and you will know by these signs that the world is changing, neither you nor the Prime Minister 
nor the minister, nor the apostles, nor the saints, has, nor the son, has any idea when it will happen. Therefore, keep awake. Therefore, do not let the hope you have become a certainty. Because what happens when you are certain of something? Let's say, for example, if you knew, uh, um, if you knew, for example, that the world would end tomorrow at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you knew that for a fact, if you knew it with absolute certainty, how would you structure the remaining hours of your time on earth? You might say, well, I'll have a good steak with people I love tonight. You can even get a bit of sleep and you can set an alarm to get up at the right time to allow you to do things you want to do tomorrow morning. Maybe uh, polish your car or as, as Martin Luther said, if I knew that the world was ending tomorrow today, I would still plant my apple tree. But the point is, if you had certainty, you no longer needed hope. Does that make sense? If you knew that your team was going to win the game and by how much, why would you even watch? Hope is waiting on and anticipating that which we are not sure, not necessarily what the end result will be, but when and how it will happen. Therefore, Jesus says, keep awake. Do not be so certain that you fall asleep because you do not know when the master will return. Interesting in this passage, that he will mention this in Mark 13. And Mark 13 is Jesus' last teaching before his uh, passion narrative in Mark begins. And he will say to his disciples, keep awake, keep awake, keep awake. And what do they do in chapter 14? They fall asleep when he prays in the garden. How often do we fall asleep? Uh, because we are certain of things we have no right being certain of in the first place. There's a saying in, um, in martial arts, in some oriental philosophies as well. The saying goes something like this. In an expert's mind, there is only ever one possible solution to a problem. If you are an expert in anything, let's take, for example, a uh, cabinet making. If you have spent some kind of time learning the trade, studying the theory, putting a few cabinets together, and someone calls you out and says, I've got a space that's 1.8 meters long by so much high, by so much wide, and I want this in the middle, I want that on that side, you will look at that and you'll make your calculations and you will come up with a limited number of solutions to that particular problem. In an expert's mind, there's only really a few ways of doing something. But in a beginner's mind, the possibilities are endless. Think about kids. Think about the way children will tackle a problem in an infinite amount of imaginative ways. And you and I might look at them and say, well, 99% of those won't work. They're irrational. But sometimes kids also come up with something that will work. And it was completely outside of your expertise or your experience. Now in martial arts, we often say, the more senior you become, the longer you do it, the more you have to think like a white belt about everything you're doing. White belt is, is, is a rank beginner. It's someone who doesn't know his left foot from his right hand. Because when you think like a beginner about problems, you can entertain infinite possibilities. When you think like an expert, you can only entertain one or two or a couple, a few. When Jesus says, 
you do not know the time of my return he is saying to you and to me you are not the expert you do not have the luxury of certainty there is not one possible answer here that you can give remind ourselves of Jesus also saying saying to his disciples on more than one occasion be like these children here have that faith that is childlike in its imagination and in its trust that all things can be possible and do it in such a way that when you think about the second coming and the end of the world you do not reduce what that means down to one or two possible answers but that you are struck again with that childlike wonder at what God can do what God has done and what God is about to do in the world and in a roundabout way this circles us back to what Isaiah prays in his reading, the one Alice brought us from Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. If you consider yourself an expert in theology, philosophy, science, geography, or common sense, you might say it's completely irrational and impossible to tear open the heavens. But imagine just for a moment that God does. And imagine just for a moment what that would mean for people who are caught beneath the rubble today. For people who have not seen their loved ones in war-torn countries for years. For people who don't even know if they are alive anymore. You see, Mark and Isaiah share something although they write 500 years apart, 600 years apart. Isaiah lived during the time when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Complete and utter destruction and despair and loss of life. Isaiah had to live through that. And Isaiah had to somehow find the words to express what his people were feeling faced with all of that destruction and so he said just Lord please if you're going to do anything tear apart heaven itself and save us and Mark writes probably two or three years before the Romans came through Jerusalem and destroyed the whole place and historians who were active in that time put the loss of life at about 1.1, 1.2 million people. 1.2 million people slaughtered, not with weapons of mass destruction, not with bombs fired from safe places, with the sword, by fire, with clubs and hands and cruelty. And Mark had to live through that as well. And Mark hears Jesus saying, you don't know the hour, you don't know the day, but you do know that it will happen. What will happen? The Son of Man will tear open heaven and come down on the clouds with all of His glory. And He will send out His angels to collect His chosen his disciples, his children. But you know, speaking of these things is one thing. Talking about what we think, what we hope, what we pray, what we uh, speculate God might do in the future is one thing. But the time of Advent is, is supposed to be also the time when we say, but He has done it. He is not breaking into the world for the first time sometime in the future. He has done it in His birth. The angels shook the earth when they sang among the shepherds on that night, Holy, Holy, Holy.
And he did it again. Chris, if I can ask you to prepare the table with me. He did it again when he, blew, when he drew his last breath at his crucifixion. When he said, it is finished. And the curtain of the temple tore in two. That, that curtain which separates the holiest of holies from us. When we celebrate, thank you Chris, when we celebrate Advent, we are in a certain sense taking on a very difficult task. We are trying our best to encapsulate everything that is a part of our faith. And we are trying to say, the story is not done yet. There is more to come. Yes, we celebrate Christmas, of course. And we celebrate it with all of the joy and expectation and anticipation that it rightly deserves. But we don't stop there. We also say the Christmas story is, much, is, is but the first breaking in of God into the world. And here we stand before the second breaking in of God into the world, which is still here now for us. Because how much more real, friends, can it be and can it become that God would come down to live among us than He would share His body and His blood as the covenant that secures for us eternal life in that kingdom of which we speak and hear in this passage. Advent is a serious time. Perhaps Advent doesn't quite get the uh, attention that it deserves in church. Maybe we're too fixated on reindeer and Santa and sleds and snow in Queensland in summer, in December. Uh, but you know, even if we lived in the Northern Hemisphere, maybe we should take Advent very seriously. Not just as a preparation for Christmas, but as a preparation for Christ. And perhaps we'll end there. We will uh, install